All right. So you're all welcome to tonight's session on the laws on wills and succession in Ghana. This is Floodlights Daily, your Christian ministry focused on faith and family. Now, this sounds like a legal program. Yes, it does. But the wills and succession is something that also affects family life. So that's how come we are looking at it today. I'm a lawyer myself, and I'll be joined by, we have been joined by our dear friend, Kezia, whose profile, brief profile I'll be reading in a bit. All right. Anyway, while she reads the profile, just to say I'm not a lawyer, so I'll provide the balance in the equation over here. So for all you non-lawyers on the, on the platform, um, I'll be speaking for you. All right. Certainly. Okay. All right. All right. So yes, I'm Suafut. This is my husband, Emmanuel. Okay. Emmanuel Afutu will be co-hosting together. Our guest is Kezia Kenes Azuma. So Kezia is a member of the Ghana Bar Association and the Greater Accra Bar of Ghana. She's a board member of Fidel Ghana and an executive member of Christian Lawyers Fellowship Ghana. She also represents English speaking West Africa in the Advocates Africa, which is a group of Christian lawyers in Africa made up of both English speaking and non English speaking Africans. Kezia is a co founder of the Light in the Law Ministry, a ministry that ministers to the spiritual growth of young Christian lawyers. She's also a partner and lawyer at Light Associate Unlimited. She's a general legal practitioner with active practice in family law, land law, and employment law. Her family currently attends International Central Gospel Church Upper Room Temple, Matahiku, Accra, Ghana. So Kezia, your audience. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you, Kezia. Thank you for the opportunity. You uh, are welcome. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Auntie Susan and um, her husband, Emmanuel. Um, I thank my family for all the support. I thank my friends who are lawyers on the call. I can see Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, we, we acknowledge all the legal fraternity that will be joining us. Yeah, and we see today. we see a, a number of people, um, and Zed, and uh, Stephen Nyameche. We see we see a number of people. I think at the end we would acknowledge also yeah. appropriately. And thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. George, we see you too. All right. Okay, so we'll be dealing with the laws on wills and on succession. It, it generally has to do with the will, which is a testament, which devises properties to people you want to give things to. I mean, on a, on a general front. Then where you don't write a will, the law 111 will deal with your estate. So these are the two issues we're going to be dealing with tonight. So Auntie Susan, can we? Sure. Yeah. So we'll start sharing the slides in a bit. Right. And we will be answering your questions once we do the presentation. The presentation will be, even though we are sharing the slides, there will be a guide. Yes, please. Yeah. So this is just about succession in terms of the wheels. The second one will deal with uh, law 111. Right. All right. right. The next slide. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do introduction. Then we'll look at the capacity. We'll look at what valid wills are in terms of the substance and the form. Would we'll, uh, advise you on who executors are and what you should look out for when you are selecting executors. Because I find that um, 
there are some times that the executors will give you problems if you don't get advice from your lawyers as to who to select as executors. I'll be sharing some practical tips when we get there. Then how can you alter your will or how can you revoke it or how can you revive it? Then we'll conclude. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, this is a Christian platform also. So we'll look at what Isaiah chapter 38 verse one says about a will. So, and I, I want to read the scripture directly. About this time, King Hezekiah became sick and almost died. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to see him and said to him, the Lord tells you that you are to put everything in order because you will not recover, get ready to die. And then 2 Samuel 17 verse 23 also talks about Ahitophel, where the Bible says that when Ahitophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and went back to his hometown. After putting his affairs in order, he hanged himself. He was buried in his family grave. So you find that the will enables you to plan for life after death. Wills do not come into effect when you are alive, but they come into effect immediately you die. How? your affairs should be managed, how your resources, your estate, even how you should be buried. Sometimes we put them in the wills, but those documents are called testamentary wishes. So generally speaking, we don't encourage you to put your testamentary wishes in your will because you'll find that um, how you will be buried comes before how your estates are dealt with. So in the testamentary wishes, we write them separately but they are also like forms of wills. And then we write your will too separately. But the will actually disposes of your tangible assets and intangible assets. For example, your house, your land, your clothing, your jewelry, your bank account, your shoes, your chattels at home, like your tables and chairs, they cannot be disposed of under your will. Next slide, please. So it is a document, what is a will? It's a document which a person directs that his or her estate should be distributed. Anytime I speak about these things, I tell my audience that if you don't write a will, people who are not talking to you will dispose of your property for you. People who, <laughs> yes, that's what has been happening. The people who don't talk to you or they didn't have any direct relationship with you will come and say they are Busia Penny, they are your siblings, they are your whatever, next of king, and will come and be dictating things to your your, your direct relations like your spouse and family members. The person who writes the will is called a testator. Okay, so I've already explained that you can do your burial instructions and you can also do your will. You can put them together, but I don't advise you to put them together because your burial instructions come in handy when your body is still around and we are trying to find out whether to put you in a Ubume or at Gethsemane. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, can we please move? Okay, so uh, the laws that govern the will, the, the, what we are discussing right now is the Wills Act of 1971, Act 360, uh, the High Court Civil Procedure Rules, and uh, CI 47, as amended by CI 87, specifically Order 66 of that um, CI, uh, speaks about wills. Who has the capacity to make a will? Next slide, please. So once you are 18 years of age and you are of sound mind and you have acquired property of any form, you can make a will. A person who does not have sound mind and who is a lunatic cannot make a will. However, if a lunatic has lucid moments or somebody with dementia has lucid moments, at the time that the person's mind is a little clear, they could make a will, okay? But a will cannot be made under duress or fraud. If you force somebody to make a will or you use your influence to uh, ask them to make a will or you, 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 the will is done by fraud, some people like to sign uh, and say somebody has made a will. The law will not uphold such wills. Please, can we move on? 
Okay, so what makes a will valid? We'll go into that in a bit. Good. There's a way a will must be done for it to be valid. It has to be in writing, in a readable form. It has to be attested by two witnesses at the same time. You can use any language of your choice, but make sure the language is you can, be, can be interpreted. And then uh, you have to type it for it to be clear. Or if you do it in a handwriting, you have to do it in an ink so that it is permanent. We, uh, we, we are not able to, uh, the Lord does not accept wills that are not clear or printed well. We are going to exceptions. The exceptions are under the, where military officers make wills. We'll get there very soon. But the normal people who are not military officers, this is how your will must be done. It has to be put in writing in a readable form. It has to be attested by two witnesses. So you, that the sister, you will sign under your will. The two witnesses will sign uh, after you have signed. And right. then uh, it has to be in your, you can even do it in your own handwriting, but it has to be clear. But we recommend okay. typing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So for the will to be valid, the signature of the testator has to be there clearly. Mm -hmm. Then the signature of two witnesses. Two of the act can also ask somebody to sign on their behalf. Can we move on to yes. Okay, you, you can go on. Yes, please. We're done. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so signatures of the attesting witnesses, it has to be, they, they have to acknowledge that they have seen your will, but they don't have to read the will. So they, they just make their mark after the mark of the testator, okay? They are attesting that they, are, they were there and they saw you sign your will. That's all their duty is. They don't have to read the will. But a beneficiary to the will cannot be an attesting witness. If you are a beneficiary and you sign as an attesting witness, your gift in the will will be revoked. It will be void. Because under the rules, you are not supposed to be the one signing as a witness. That is what the law says. Okay. okay. Uh, All right. So if, uh, So if the person who is signing the will is an illiterate or is blind or cannot understand um, the language in which the will is written, as somebody else will have to read it to the person and will have to say in a document called the jurat, it's also called an attesting clause. So we have to say that I, Kezia, I read, Kwame's will to him, and he understood it before he signed. But if you don't do that to an illiterate uh, testator, and he makes his mark, somebody can go to court and set it aside for the lack of the jurat, because uh, they know that the person was not literate. How did he sign a will? Was he forced, or what was uh, done to him? Anytime. The, 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 the court feels that somebody was forced or they were not in their right frame of mind, they would consider that will to be void or set it aside, okay? So there is no particular, if you, look, if you read the director's book, it doesn't have a particular uh, form that, by which the testing clause should be, should be made, but you should just say that uh, you were there and you explained to the testator, the testator understood it, even though he's illiterate, even though he's blind, and then he agreed, to the content, he certified it and he signed. Once you put that one under the signature of the testator, your will is good to go. Shall we proceed, please? Now, these are the exceptions to the wills, which are valid. As I said earlier on, uh, there are wills that are called privileged wills. 
for people in the armed forces who are in active service, this is defined in the Armed Forces Act of 1962, Act 105. Because it's not a legal lecture, I don't want to go into the what is legal service or what is not legal service. But essentially, anybody in the army and in, let's say, on the war front or in the in active service in the army and has to quickly write a will because there's a certain danger, they are allowed to put their will in their own handwriting, even without witnesses. They can also put their will, it's in the next slide. They can mm -hmm. also put their will in uh, uh, by just writing it and one witness will sign, it will be valid. They can also make their will orally to two witnesses. So for example, when they sense danger as army officers or maybe a battle front, there's an emergency and they feel that they may not come back to us. They may call two people and narrate what they want to be done to their estate in their absence to those two persons. Once they do that, their will is valid. If they just scribble their will on a paper and sign it, that, that will is valid. If they write it out and one person signs it, that will is valid. So this is the only exception to all the rules regarding the will. But for you and I, you must go through all the necessary procedures, which has been stated above. Because of time, we will deal with your other questions when we are done yeah. with the presentation. So please, shall we proceed so that when we finish, after this, yeah. I will do, we will do the interstate one, then we'll come to your questions and we'll... Okay. So who are the executors? Now, executors must be people who can enter into contracts. They must be, 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 be beyond 21 years of age. So don't select executors who are younger than 21. You will make the work uh, void. Secondly, uh, in my limited years of practice, you should select executors that you can trust, select executors who can take care of your children if they are young, and then if you are working with your spouse in any company, select your spouse as an executor. Now, this is not in the slide, but I'd like to share it for purposes of our learning. When I was a younger lawyer, a, a gentleman willed his hospital to his two children and he willed the matrimonial home to his wife. Um, the woman, they were a doctor and a nurse. So it is the doctor who died, that's the, the man. And the executors were his nephew and a friend. They took the wife to court because according to them, the wife was intermeddling. Intermeddling is an offense of dealing with an estate without authority. Now they said the woman was dealing with the hospital without authority because she was not an executor. In the findings of the court, the judge said that judge is even late now, but he said that look, the woman had to continue to run the hospital because she has to use the money to look after the children. But because she was not an executor, she was in breach of the law. So All the right. initial thing the judge did was to ask us to go and settle the case. We, we, we couldn't settle it, you see. So the point I'm trying to make is that when, when you want to select executors, consult your lawyers with the facts of your particular matter so that we can give you the guidelines as to who the executors will be. The executors will have to make sure that the beneficiaries to their will are taken care of, but don't select executors because of just selecting them. Because in that particular case, if the judge didn't uh, do extra, extra, extra work, the woman would have been found wanting under the law of intermediate. That's the main point I'm trying to make here. Sure. Just a minute, Kezia, yeah, just to make, break it down to um, layman understanding. So when we see an executor in a way, an executor is somebody who you name as going to be responsible to share the property in the will. Yes. To put it in, in layman language, the, the person so it's required that you put some names and you inform them that I've put your name in my will, you are going to be the executor to help distribute this property upon my death. It can be a trusted friend, it can be a lawyer as well. Yes, and then when we say an estate, when we use the word estate as, as lawyers, an estate does not mean an estate house. An estate is, yes, an estate is what a person leaves behind after their death. All of their tangible and intangible property, even their chattels like their cars, their TVs, their clothes, their houses, their lands, intangible assets like copyrights, 
that they own shares and companies, all of that together, we call it your estate. All right, so um, Kezia, you may go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is not the Abra for that we know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so essentially, select executives that you can trust, but you may not tell them. You don't have to tell them under the law. Just that okay. you have people that you trust, that they will carry out your wishes properly and appropriately. Can we please move, proceed? Okay, so there's something called residual clause. Residual clauses deal with the things that you may acquire after you have executed the will. So for example, you executed your will 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, you had just a house, two cars, some two plots uh, in the central region, things like that. Then currently you have three houses at Airport Hills, uh, one seafront property at Ada and all that. Your residual clause is a clause that we put under every will that says that all properties that I may die possess of, which is not in this will, I give to A, B, and C. So it takes care of properties that were not listed or that you didn't have at the time of executing the will, but which you now have at the time that you are dying or the time that the will is being uh, operationalized because you have now died, okay? So you, there's always a need to put down a residual clause. And that's why I advise people to always go and seek lawyer's advice. If you write the will yourself, you may not know that there's a need for a residual clause or you may not even put down an appropriate residual clause. So all those other properties will fall into intestacy. Any properties that are not in your will. And if your will does not have the appropriate Residual clause. Every property that you acquired after the execution of your will, will fall into intestacy. You don't want that to happen. So we need a clause that enables all the properties to be dealt with appropriately after the Lord calls you home. Can we proceed, please? Okay, wills can be altered. How can we alter them? Uh, you can alter them by changing them. So, for example, uh, by you can you can uh, all the wills that we write whether this is it's your, it's your first will or your second or your third we say that all the beginning paragraphs one of the statements that are made there is that I revoke all previous wills and whatever 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 is the lawyers will put it there for you and you can also alter them by writing a codicil a codicil is an attachment you you may want to vary a, a certain disposition in your will. We want to vary how you are sharing something. If I want codicil that I saw, uh, the man put a special money for a particular grandson who was named after him. He put it in his codicil. He said, oh, this is my grandson named after me. When I'm not there, he should be giving some so so and so dollars. It was good money. So that is how codicils are done. They are a kind of an amendment or a little addition to the will. That's how wills are altered, okay? You cannot merely cancel it and then write the manyama inside and that is uh, this you know, alteration. So you can always revoke your will at any time. Mm. Mm. So that's what I said earlier, where you say that all previous wills are revoked and then so, so, and so, and so, so. You can also do a separate document, which we call the codicil. Uh, and the state may directly revoke uh, his will by a later will. So for example, if you deposit two wills, one was deposited, deposited five years ago and one was deposited last uh, year or, or this year, the court will read this year's will and will not read five years ago's will because it would uh, think that it is this year that you really, uh, what you have just deposited is the one you want to take effect and that the previous one you have revoked by the deposition of the new will, okay? So that's how we revoke wills. All right, so Kezia, um, some of us are not aware, where are the wills supposed to be deposited? Uh, we deposit it uh, usually in the high court of every region, wherever you are found. In Accra, we go to the Accra high court. Now the rules are quite strict, so the, you send a picture 
of the person who has written their will, their ID card, the lawyer's stamp must be there and all that. Those requirements, they didn't used to be there, but for some time now, uh, because some people are depositing fake wills and things, <laughs> they, have, they have now made the deposition of wills very strict, but any high court is fine. Yes. Mm. Right on. So, yes. You wanted to say something? No, um, I, I, was, I was asking whether to go on. Yes, yes, you can go on. Yes. You can go on. Yes, you can go on. Okay, so how do you revive wills? You can revive a will. Okay, by executing a new one in the same manner prescribed by law, by just adding an, another document, we call this codicil, uh, where the will was revoked by means of physical destruction, then it can only be revived by execution of another will. So if you tore your will into pieces, uh, you, can, you have to now write another one. Otherwise, you don't have any will. <laughs> if the one you tore, you didn't deposit it. Uh, okay. Somebody is asking if the will can be in a video form. Uh, I haven't seen that one. We write it. That's what the law is saying. Okay. <laughs> uh, Maybe for the Ghana Armed Forces, they may accept a video. <laughs> what about the ones so. we see in videos, uh, in movies, you know, the whole family gathers and there's a will and the whole family is fighting and blah, blah, blah. And that one is like Saman Su. Eh? That one, it is a traditional way of making a will. We call it Saman Su where you call all your children and you tell them this house is for you, this room is for you, this shoe is for you. That one is also accepted, but you must have a lot of witnesses. Uh, family members must be present, your next of kin must be there, successor, your children, everybody, they're gathered around your deathbed and they are listening to how you are, you are giving it. So it's not two people hiding in a certain room to say they heard that they are giving them a will, no. So at the time of the, the execution of the will, you had a certain property. If at the time that you are dying, the property is not there, we call something a doctrine of redemption. It cannot be there. It cannot be given to the person because maybe you sold it to look after yourself when you were in hospital. Uh, so that one, uh, uh, what's the name? There are some people who say Ashi. It's called doctrine of redemption. <laughs> and they can't say redemption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. All right. <laughs> All right. so, so we have something called lapse of gifts. A gift made in a will is said to lapse where the beneficiary predeceases the testator. Some beneficiaries die earlier than the testator. So if they give you something and uh, you are you couldn't wait to inherit it and you have died, uh, that one too, it can't go to you now. Mm, it has come back to the owner. Then the rule of comorientis. Uh, where two people die at the same time, but they are the testator and the beneficiary. The law will presume that the testator was the one who died first, so that the gift will go to the beneficiary or the, the people who benefit through the beneficiary. Okay, these are legal terms. We don't want to go into the details of them. Madam, please, let's proceed. So I can do the other one. I think we'll end here. So, All right. I will only take effect when you die. So, when you write your will, it will be there quietly until you die before it can be executed. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 to 17. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it has died. For a will means nothing, while the person who made it is alive. It goes into effect only after his death. And let the saints say, Amen. 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 Now we are going to go into intestate succession. Then we'll quickly come and answer our questions. Then we can have discussions, please. Yes, 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 yes. Let me just find where that is. I think it should be this. All right. So we're looking next at interstate succession laws of Ghana. What happens when somebody dies without making a will in Ghana? All right. Okay. Oh, okay, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is essentially what happens when you didn't write a will. 
and uh, you've been called earlier than you planned. Uh, it may interest you to know that even a lot of us lawyers don't write wills. Last week, I was somewhere and I was speaking to some people about the need to write a will. Somebody said, Me, I'm not going to write any will, be here. for whatever reason. Some people think that when they write wills, it means they're going to die early. I have clients who have written wills in their 40s, they are still alive. They are there. That has happened to them. Their will is still in my custody. So, writing a will doesn't mean I'm going to die. But I've also had clients who immediately they wrote their will. One of them, I think he knew he was on his way, but he didn't tell me. So he wrote his will in six months and he was gone. Wow. But the will saved his wife a great deal because the will actually covered even the pregnancy that the wife was carrying. Because he kept asking me, so uh, the child that has not been born, what do we do? I said, oh, we would couch it nicely in the will. Don't worry. So we couched the pregnancy and everything in the will, and the child was covered nicely. So the kind of family that man had, if he didn't have a will, it would have been troublesome. I mean, <laughs> very difficult. You see, so if you leave without a will, this is what is going to happen. Shall we proceed, please? So as we said earlier, we have dealt with the tested parts of succession, we are going to now deal with the intestate part of succession. So there are two types of succession. Tested, where you wrote a will, intestate, where you did write a will. Shall we move on, please? The person died uh, with a will. So that person left instructions. Give this to that person. Do this, do that, do that. That one is called tested succession. Okay? We are there to do. So, so intestate succession is governed by PNDC Law 111. Before PNDC Law 111, you will find in the subsequent slides that the accounts had a way of distributing property, the girls had a way, the Dagbani had a way. There was a lot of conflict and difficulty for a lot of people who were uh, dying intestate, especially if the, the provider died intestate. The family members, if it's matrilineal side, oh, there's trouble. Matrilineal sides were generally okay, but the matrilineal side had serious issues. So, uh, ex President Rawlings and his people decided to put in a law to protect widows, especially. It doesn't mean that men cannot be protected under PNDC law. There are cases, there's a Kwe and Kwevi also, those of us who are lawyers. There's a certain case which was decided by Georgina Wood when she was a high court judge, where she gave the properties to the man who had lost his wife. So it's not only, being this law one does not be only cover women who have lost their husbands. It also covers men who, has, who have lost their wives and who didn't have wills. And even covers people who are in uh, informal marriages eh, that have not been uh, properly married under particular custom, that if you can prove an informal marriage, law 111 will cover you nicely. Shall we proceed, please? So as I said earlier on, you see the airways, the guns, the northern people, they are patrilineal. So uh, the issues about the association was not as difficult as the Fanti, the Achims, and the, those who are matrilineal, where generally speaking, the properties were inherited by their Brothers, children, okay. their sisters' children, uh -huh. yeah. sisters' children, and then under the Islamic law, there's a certain way that they distribute their property. Uh, that one I'm not too conversant, but it's not also very very nice from what I, the little that I know, women are disadvantaged under that distribution. But when you come under law one one one, there's no gender distribution. Uh, the, the, uh, discrimination. discrimination. There's no gender discrimination. If you are a child, you are a child. If you are a wife, you are a wife. If you are a husband, you are a husband. Shall we proceed, please? Okay, so uh, law and one was brought into force because of the more inhuman and uh, inequitable distribution of properties. So it, it made the distributions more uniform, okay? This belongs to this person because he's a husband. He's a wife, she's a wife, she's a child. Children inherit their parents, not because they were born inside the marriage or outside the marriage. So those uh, wives who think that if a child is born outside the marriage, 
they'll be disinherited. Lie, lie, not true. Once a child can be proven to be a child of the person who is diseased, they will inherit their parents. Shall we proceed, please? So as Christians, we have to pray that there are no extra children from anywhere. <laughs> That's what you should do. Okay, so how do you distribute properties? Self-acquired properties and not family properties, okay? Let's move on. So um, properties include even furniture, the cars, clothing, electrical appliances, all these things are actually given to the wife and children. No family member is allowed to come and drive away the car that the family was using. Hmm? If it was just uh, the private car of the disease, don't come and drive it away because the disease has died. Okay, yeah. Let's proceed, please. Mm, so money in the bank, SNITS, pension, and all that. When we get to a certain position, you will find um, how SNITS pensions are dealt with if the person dies leaving minor children. 60% of the SNITS benefits will go directly to the minor children. And if you have been named as a beneficiary, you will be made to share the rest of the 40%. If their wife and children are not named in the SNITS pensions, we go for what we call variation of SNITS benefits put their wives and their husbands and their children inside it, okay? Okay, so there's a chart that we have developed as feeder and we'll be sharing it very soon. And that chart will show you how the distributions will be done when the person left a wife, children, left a husband, children, left parents, left this and left that, okay? So shall we proceed, please? And so if the person who died left a spouse, left a child, left a parent, left family, this is the distribution according to the uh, law 111. So when the person died without a surviving parents, this is how the distribution will look like, okay? Pictorially, there are ways of calculating it in percentages. So we move on. Uh, so when the person dies with no children, but they had their parents, they had family, they had a spouse, but they didn't have children, this is how the distributions would happen. Shall we proceed, please? And then the person died with a spouse only and with family. So the spouse and the family, they are likely to share equally. And move on. Thank you, Auntie Sheila. Grateful for your support. Okay, so when the person dies and they had children, they had a parent, they had a family, this is what the graph will look like. Okay. Maybe in our next presentation, we'll talk about why Law 111 is under some amendments. The amendment is not yet out. But these figures that we have shown also bring some kind of confusion, Kakra. But today we are not going there. We are going into what we are doing now. So the Interest Succession Amendment Law says that it is criminal to come and move out a spouse and children from a matrimonial home, okay? The matrimonial home, when a person dies, is for the spouse and their children, simpliciter. So if the children are four in the marriage, four outside the marriage, all of them will come together and be in the house. That is what it is. Or if there are four, plus their parents, they will be there. You don't come and move them out. If you move them out, first of all, we'll report you to the police. Secondly, we'll take you to court for intermeddling. The court will deal with you. So if the value of the property is less than 10 million, I don't know what 10 million means today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spouse and children. Mm -hmm. And when the children are not training, they have to be providing for them under the state of the disease. Uh, so children are defined as born in the marriage and born outside the marriage. So those who are missuses and wedded madams. Eh, this person is, a, there's no legitimate children in Ghana, I beg you. There's no legitimate children in Ghana. Somebody says, I'm completed building. Who oh, come there, please. <laughs> building is building. 
<laughs> okay, so I have spoken about the split pension already. Uh, I, I hope we were listening when I was speaking. Children under 18, whether they are nominated or not, 60% will go to them. And then the people who are nominated will take the rest of the 40%. And if their spouse or the parent or a dependent, like a parent is depending on the disease and is not named in the beneficiaries, they may go to SNIT for variation. We will come to court and vary it for them. Okay, let's move on, please. Then, okay, so when a person does, what should you do? Find out if they made a will. How would you find out? You write a letter, you go to a lawyer. The lawyer writes a letter to the high court and say, I want to find out if this person had a will. Now it is highly automated. So even if you don't have a date or whatever, by the time you write at least two letters, you'll be sure that the person wrote a will or didn't write a will. Or the person deposited a will or didn't deposit a will. So when people lose their spouses, the first things we do is to write letters to the high court to check whether or not there are wills. That's if their spouses are not sure whether or not there are wills. But if you are here and you are married, at least you may not tell your spouse the details of your will, depending on the arrangement. Some people too write joint wills. I've written joint wills for husbands and wives before. Uh, those husbands and wives who do a lot of things together, they write joint wills. So those ones, they know that once one of them kaput, there's a will. But those of those who do not know will have to write letters to the court and the court would uh, say, yes, there's a will. No, there's no will. In the past, it was difficult to ascertain because it was not uh, automated, now it is automated. So you just put their names, the workplace of the person and everything to pop up directly. Yes, there is, no, there's no. Sometimes you even, the pop-up will come and say, he deposited one in 1998 and deposited one in 2002. So they'll come and read the 2002 will, okay? And then those people can apply for LA uh, under the law or the 66 of CI47, the surviving wife or surviving spouse, children, parents, customized successor. And now the writing of the will is not uh, just a second case here. What is an LA? What is the letter of administration? Oh, letters of administration are applications we make to the court when the person didn't write a will to say that the person has died and we want to administer his head state. The BNA, the CI 47 or the CTC says that the people, the priority who can apply are the following, the spouse, children, parents, or the customary successor. So what happens when the person dies without a will and they want to administer his estate is that you do an application, you go to a lawyer for the lawyer to do an application. That application will have to be done by the spouse, sometimes together with the children, or if the parents are alive, they may join. If the customer is alive, is alive, is alive they may join. Uh, in a few cases, all these people are not in agreement. So the lawyer may write to them and try to bring them together. If we try a few times and they're bringing you together is not working, we'll go to the court and depose to the facts and show the letters that we have written. Sometimes the court itself will order them to come to court. And uh, sometimes too, the court will grant the application. And if, if anybody wants to caveat, they would cave yet. So that's what happens. So that is where you didn't write a will. Uh -huh. Katia, who is a customary successor? Oh, usually families select people who are supposed to succeed the deceased. All right. So when somebody dies, they'll say, oh, this person will succeed him. Uh, he will take care of the children. He will do this, he will do that. That person is a customized assessor of the right. disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so this is how some cases have been determined. So that will help us to appreciate some of the things that we have done under law 111. Let's go to Prempe. How many minutes do I have, please? Oh, I think you're you're doing fine. So let's go on. I think it's you have 10 minutes. Okay, we will be done very soon. But I think you've been passed. Uh, it, it's it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of Prempe and Ajipon, the issue was whether a concubine can claim a property of a disease. Okay, the first is that the disease was a lawyer. He was with a concubine. 
He didn't have a will. So let's go to what the court said. So the court said the concubine had to provide the that should prove the existence of a valid marriage under ordinance or customary law. She cannot claim the house. You see, not every concubine can claim, but some concubines can claim. Let me tell you which concubine can claim. The ones who are living with them, the partner, and are playing the roles of a spouse, are attending funerals, are giving donations and supporting, are raising children together, are holding themselves out as partners. Those people, they will claim. Mm? So this issue about you are not a wife, you are not a wife, doesn't always work. I mean, I've done a few cases where the people who were not direct wives, they have claimed power, we have collected things for them. If you put out yourself as a spouse, you are playing the role of a spouse. You, if whether you have children or not, you are attending funerals, the families are acknowledging you that, oh, our wife, our husband, our wife, our husband, you go claim. So those of us who think, oh, they are not mine, they are not mine. Some people, even in some police stations, will be telling the women, hey, you cry, you are not ready, you are not ready. Please stop that. <laughs> you should come and see lawyer Kezia. <laughs> no, no, don't say that too, because they come and say I'm touting. I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what happened in the case of Apia and Banini, 1991. What is the meaning of a home in PNC one? In this case, the person died uh, when the house was not completed. Okay, they were building to go into it, but it was not completed. Then the mother of the disease came to say, sure, it is not a house, Bia. it is a completed house. So the court should not hold that it is a matrimonial home or it's a possible matrimonial home. The court said, oh, boy, lie, lie. <laughs> it is a home. <laughs> it's a matrimonial home. The wife will benefit, the children will benefit. That's the decision in Apia and Banini, 1991. Can we proceed? It's in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's what the court said, it's a house, it's a home. So the widow and the children were entitled to it. They collected it quietly, coolly. Please, let's move on. <laughs> so in the case of Ama and Ama, PNDC law 111 can be used to distribute a, disease, distribute a disease who died in 1980s property. So for example, the person died in 1980. The law came into force in 1985. But just at the time the law came into force, his estate had not been administered. Now, just last Friday, I went to a, a, get an S, a LA for somebody whose estate has remained unadministered for 34 years. Mm -hmm. 34. We got it uh, admitted last week, Friday, after going to court for a few times anyway. The, the judge kept saying, I want this, then we go and bring it. I want that, we go and bring it. I want this, we go and bring it. 34 years. So this is a similar case where the person died earlier. Nobody had gone for an LA. Then somebody now says, oh, let us share the thing and allow on. The person said, no, 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 no. No, the person died in 1980. He cannot come under law one, one But because he brought the application after law one, one, one the law one, one, one was applied. And it is right that they did that because the application was brought after law one, one, one not before law one, 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 okay? So let's move on, please. I want to finish and then we can now talk about all your questions. What did the court say? Well, one one was applied, okay? Because the property had not been distributed. So it constituted a pending matter. Okay, all right. Uh, have there been problems applying law one one? Yes, very problematic because uh, of the fragmentations. Some people don't agree with the sharing. Uh, the sharings are not clear. So that's why there is a law now trying to amend law one, one so that, for example, if you are marrying under customary law and your wives are two, uh, there must be a provision that deals with that one. Because there are customary law marriages where the women are not just one woman, two women, 15 children, and things like that, okay? So the law is under review, okay? So when parliament passes it, we'll come back, come and educate everybody on it. Shall we proceed, please? Uh, so when someone dies and has not written a will, on pause really, the one will apply to administer their estate. 
So I thank you very much. Now we'll go into your questions. There are some live questions. In the and chat then, box, yeah. And there were questions that were in the slides. I don't know the where we are. Okay, I think, Kezia, or... let's have, um, can we start with the questions in the chat? Then we'll move on yes, to yes, the yes. link. That's uh -huh. okay, any way, any way you want, we will do Okay, it. so we start with the ones in the chat box. Okay, okay. Yes, we'll send the slides. Somebody wants to know, we'll send the slides afterwards by the same way you got the link. We'll circulate the slides as well. Yes, um, Elias wants to know, what's the legal definition for a person with unsound mind? A person with un what is the legal definition for a person with unsound mind? Oh. How does the law define that? Hmm. Okay, a person of unsound mind, uh, forgive my language, for, forgive me, but it's a lunatic. Okay, or somebody who has even dementia. Okay, I did a case where a, a man had signed off a house to his wife. The other parties came to say the man has dementia, so he couldn't sign it off. The unsound mind generally has to deal with people who don't have the mental capacity to execute legal documents as we are stating right now. Eh? I don't have any law and a, or direct case that I can quote right now. Okay. All right, sure, but sure, generally, right. if your mind is not correct, you are in some pantan drugs and things like that, you cannot say that you can write a will at that time. Sure. But then sure. the caveat is that if you have a lucid moment, there are times people with dementia, dementia, sometimes they're able to be clear at some points. At the time that they are sound, they can make their will. If you can prove that they were not, the will was not done under duress and due influence and fraud, it will be valid. Okay. Okay. I think maybe one of the, maybe the reasons for that question would be somebody makes a will and then the family or some other people go and say that, the person did not write it with a clear mind or did not have a sound, a sound mind at that time. Um, do we have such cases? And um, so that, that's, I think, what would be one of the references for the question. Do we have such cases occurring where somebody's written yes. a will and then later somebody says the person didn't write it in a sound mind uh, or in yes. a state of sound mind? We have that a lot. So some, some lawyers would um, will go into taking the instructions by actually videoing the instructor, like the person who is giving me an instruction to write a will. Uh, we may video them sometimes uh, as backup to show that it was their own mind. They spoke their own mind. Nobody was there to influence their decision as to who gets what and all that. And some of the testators go ahead and say reasons why they are giving house number two to this person. Okay, they don't just say, I give house number two, but they say, oh, this child served me in this capacity, or oh, this my wife did this for me, this my husband did that for me, so in appreciation, I give him my Mercedes-Benz E class, or things like that. Yeah, so sometimes, yeah. but a lot of these granted people come up with a lot of stories when the people die, you see, and uh, there was there, there's a, a, a latest decision of the Supreme Court uh, decided by Justice Amekache as a lead judge. He said that if you die, as if your parent dies and you are an adult, it's not compulsory that they should give you anything because some entitled children went to court and said they were not given anything. So they come to challenge the will of the parents. That was the decision of the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, I didn't bring that authority, but it's an, my, one of my favorite authorities these days that no child is entitled to anything if you are a majority. And if they've looked after you well, their will yeah. is the person's free will. They can decide that they'll give everything to charity and move on. Or give everything to people who, who in their view, are deserving or needing of their estate, not necessarily because you are their child. All right. All okay. right. Okay. There's a question here. PM says, can a spouse challenge a will in the event he or she believes there has been an unfair share especially when he or she believes they, they both made the wealth. Yes, uh, some of the 
estates that I've dealt with. I remember uh, when you go to read the will to get the probate, you have to actually uh, pay money to the court, 3% now of the estate. So there was a widow who said, ah, but these houses, we got it together. Why did he put it in, in his will, put it in his name and can't be disturbing everybody? <laughs> you, you know? So uh, essentially, people can go ahead and say the thing is joint. So I don't see why he put it in his name. But if you want to challenge it, you must prove that you were a major contributor because that time the person had died and you are not dealing with a divorce, okay? So you have to come and give us evidence of what your real tangible contributions were. Not the fact that in the divorce case, you can just say, oh, I was a wife cleaning and cooking. I was taking children to school. I was doing this when the person was abroad studying. I was the one driving him and all that will help you in the, under the divorce situation. But when it comes to the estate part, you have to actually be proving hard things. I mean, how you set up that school, what role did you play and all that? Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's a okay, question. Okay, hold on. Hold on a second. Mental, Act, Mental Health Act 2012 uh, has a definition for uh, who is in a proper state of... Thank you, Charlotte. I'm so grateful. All right. All right. Okay. You, you want to read it all? Uh, the Mental Health Act of 2012, Act okay. 846, provides a good definition of what mental health or illness is and what capacity means. The law presumes everyone to be mentally sound unless and unless the presumption is rebutted. So whoever says someone is not mentally sound should come and prove, give us reasons why. That's what the law is saying. Thank okay. You so much. Okay. Okay. So I think the next question, you've already answered it, but it's here again. It says, okay. and the uh, will be in a video form, you you sort of said that no, Ghana's uh, law just allows us for written, right? Yeah. But you've also stated sort of um, in, the, in your last um, comments that in order to rebut um, what the sound mind, you take video. So this question, can, can the will really be in video form? No, I said no, no. But what I'm saying is that some practitioners protect themselves, you know, because when the will that I have prepared is called into question, I may even come to mount the witness box to say that at the time I took the instruction, this is what happened. You get the point. So some practitioners are advocating that we take video when we are collecting the instructions. So the video will help to show that the person spoke himself or herself the person um, was not influenced. The person uh, had the correct mental state and all the rest of it, okay? What we do as practitioners is to just guide the, the people to say, oh, uh, why do you want to do it this way? And things like that. That's the only thing the practitioner can do to guide, but not to influence what they do and what they don't do. Okay, okay, okay. Um, some of the questions would deem it as having been dealt with, so would be some of them. Maybe if we can just go. So yeah. Leticia says that if a will must be deposited in a high court, does it mean that it's not valid if it is not found in the high court? Uh, then my experience is that you have to, in fact, even if you discover, some wills are discovered after the death of the people, the, the, the state, okay? But immediately you discover it, you must lodge it in the high court. Immediately you discover the will, you must lodge it in the high court. And then you must call for it to be read in the high court. And then the probate procedures will start. I um, remember so that I wrote a will for someone who was 90. So I went to his house to write the will in somewhere April or so. And because of the new instructions, bring picture, bring that, bring that, I couldn't go and look for his picture and all those things. Then I was somewhere in a bar conference when the man passed. And I was called and told that the man had passed. So immediately I came back from the conference. I just told his son that, oh, can I have Papa's picture? That's all I did, collect his picture from the son. I didn't even tell him anything. And I went to deposit the will. And then the people who uh, were... You know, some people fund the process because this is quite a little bit expensive. 
So the founders of the process came one year after the man had died. And we applied to the court, read the will, and we've moved on, you see. But you have to deposit the, in the high court. I don't see, I don't know how you would be admitting a will that has not been deposited. I don't know yeah. how, yeah, yes. Because you, even when you deposited in a high court, people come and say it is not his will, we don't like the deposition, it's not his signature, this and that and that happened, there's something fishy about it. Uh, even when the person, I remember there, there was a will that was read recently, and the man gave things to his children. He had children with three different women. So he gave things to so so and so's children, then he will list them and give them. So so and so children, he will list them and give them. So so and so children. Then he gave even to his family members who were helping him to run his businesses. But when we left the reading, one of the men was very angry because I don't know. I don't know. You know, people are never satisfied even when wills are done in their best interests or whatever. They feel that, oh, my father should have been. I, I remember one of my friends, eh, she's a very good friend of mine. The father gave her some, he said, oh, I wanted this particular one, right? And I was saying in my head, that, ah, you, probably, you are lucky they gave you some. You had this inherited <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have some fans from uh, uh, Uncle uh, Imos Kavinana and says, thank you, kids. Yeah, it's very plain yet instructive. So the next. Oh, and nice. so, but but Uncle Lemos wanted to talk about women making wills. I don't know whether he has posted a question. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll talk about that. I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. Yes. But if you know the question, maybe you can answer it probably. And so, okay, so the wills are not restricted to just men or women making wills. Anybody above 18 who has acquired something that they want to distribute, or they don't want somebody else to come and say, I am a Busapeni, so I'm sharing it anyhow, anyhow. They should make their wills. That's the the main point. Now, some people who are married have a lot of properties that are joint. So those couples can do joint wills. Mm -hmm. And even in the joint will, there are situations where the other things were uh, uh, acquired by you alone, the wife alone or the husband alone. So in the joint wills, there's a slight difference. I mean, that person will give that thing to somebody and things like that. But most of the time, the joint wills are Let's say, if we are giving house number one to child number A, both of them will give house number one to child number A and, and things like that. That's how joint wills are done. If you see your lawyers, they will guide you appropriately. So wills are not restricted only to men uh, uh, writing it and leaving things for their wives and children. Women too, right? I've written wills for a few women who have also left things for uh, their spouses and children. Just that. <laughs> the women, the way they write their wills is very different. I will encourage them to change. I don't want to disclose it here, but <laughs> uh, so uh, women also write their wills and they do their best. So it's not a gender uh, matter that only men write. No, 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 no. Women can write and then things like that. Yes. So that is my answer to that question. Yeah, I think it's, as, as long as the woman has her individual property, right, she can dispose of it in her will. Yes, she can, but okay. even if I think that even if her name is on a property, which means that she's a fifty percent shareholder, she can write a will and say that my interest in this property her goes interest in it. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. even if you are a co-owner, you can write and say my interest oh, in yeah. goes to this and that, and it is yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Bye. All right. But I think under the patrilineal and matrilineal system, I think you've answered that question. Um, when you did the interest, it's all right. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. So, alcoholic, narcotic um, intoxication can be put. Okay. This is um, answering. I think, yeah. I think George, our friend George, who is also a lawyer, trying to help with the question that was asked earlier on about person of unsound mind and you're saying alcoholic yes. narcotic intoxication yes can also put you in unsound mind okay yes and then someone is saying can we see the thank clauses? you uncle george someone is asking if residuary clauses can be placed in codicils that's nadia can residuary clauses be placed in a codicil oh, don't have that experience a codicil is like an amendment to the will it's a it's, um, something that you want to add to a will or you want to clarify, there's a provision in your will 
you want to make a clarification or you want to make a, a certain slight modification to the will. So my limited experience, this one is practice. I don't know about another lawyer, but the residual clauses are usually in the main wills. The court still talks about, oh, I want to shift house number two from this person to that person rather, or uh, the one I have done or the one I have seen. The, this child was named after me, my grandson, so, so, and so named. So I moved these dollars to be put in a trust for him. That is what I found in one of the things that I've done, but I, I haven't found it in uh, many times. I, the residual was basically written under the main will to deal with right. matters and, and acquisitions that are made after the will has been executed and deposited. Sure, all right. Um, so just a quick one, um, Nadia, you, you put something over there on, um, I think in terms of um, will, making a will or dying interstate in the, in, when it comes to the Quran way. And you said you had a case in which, which involved my elder sister and the family of the deceased husband. They totally disagreed to having anything to inherit and even against the Quran. I don't know whether you're online, but could you unmute? Maybe you could share, maybe just a quick, because we are learning together. Probably maybe we can learn a thing or two. Um, Nadia, if you're still on. Hi, okay, I'm here. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so the issue was that, uh, okay, good evening, sorry. Good evening, Nadia. Good evening. Yeah, so per, um, the, yeah, per the experience I ended up making it, so it was kind of difficult for the family to agree for myself start to have a share of the property so everything for themselves and we had to interested in making a, uh, and after making the la which actually required us to go um according to the quran for the sharing even with that they still didn't agree okay 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 okay, okay. all right so i guess that's so also something okay yeah, so sometimes I think it depends on the family as well. No, but I, I'm thinking that the reason why Law 101 was uh, promulgated was to deal with all these disagreements and disparities, whether yeah. with tradition, with a certain religion, or with a certain culture. Okay, so for me, yeah. if I am in a certain uh, environment where the culture does not support the wife and children. I will go under the law. I will not agree that they okay. share it under my religion. Uh, I will go under the law because the law will be much more fair and firm. It yeah. will not look at whether I am a man or a woman because somebody wanted to give me a case, but the case didn't come. He was telling me that uh, under the Quran, they give more to the male children and, and give lesser to the female children. And he had tried, he, he's a Muslim lawyer. He had tried to settle her, but the people were being stubborn. And so he wanted to give the thing to me so that I'll go to court and deal with them there, but it didn't come. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking that if you, you have a situation like that, go under the law. So whether the person agrees or not, it's not your matter. See? All right. Okay. All right. Quick, quick. If they're I'm not agree for you to worship in a particular mosque, go to another mosque. <laughs> 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 Nadia, all right. Thank, thanks for thanks for sharing, Nadia. I'm sure you can take it up if it's not resolved. All right. Trudy has uh but Auntie okay, Sheila no. says uh says uh good good program. Auntie Sheila, good evening. Yes, all right. Yes, okay. Yes, yes, Auntie Sheila, good evening to you. Thanks for coming. Trudy good wants evening. to know hi. Good evening. All right. Okay. Trudy wants to know if um when you when you draft a will, can you also dispose of property that is not registered, land that is not registered, or does it only cover registered property? Well, it's not registered, but is it for you? Uh, that's the issue. Uh -huh. the, the, the law says things that you have acquired. You have to start the registration. I mean, make sure your document is somewhere in the pipeline and things like that. Then you can put it in your will, okay? Uh, before the new land act, 
registration was not a very strict matter. But now the way things are going, the new land act based registration sign uh, quite uh, a very, very critical issue. So even if you have bought property at a location where they say you cannot register, at least have an indenture, have the indenture stamped, okay? Have something that puts the property in your name to a certain extent. You can pass that one on, okay? At least have an indenture, have it stamped. Okay? All right. I think Trudy, Trudy raised her hand. I don't know whether she wants to ask or maybe add some clarity. Okay, contribution. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Trudy, your hand is up. Um, okay, so I think I've understood. I wanted to find out. Example, my dad. So he keeps on saying, I've not done the papers to my house. So I've not done the papers. You know, I have to take it to land commission. I have to do this. I think he hasn't even done the search. So in case, assuming... <laughs> God forbid, he passes out. Such um, an estate, assuming the children want to um, claim it or write to court, will it be accepted? Because for instance, he might not have even fulfilled government requirement on um, owning such a property. I don't know if you get me. So fortunately for you, you are alive, he's alive and he's saying, I want to do my property, I want to do this too. I want to go and uh, uh, last commission. You are the beneficiaries at the end of the day. So take it up, help him, contact one or two people who can help start the process. And gradually, gradually, you get your land uh, certificate. Recently, I was with uh, one of my friends who is a judge, and she said her brother had lived in a house for years, I don't want to mention on this call, and there was no paper. But they had to do uh, go, 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 and they got the paper. So the day they got the paper, it was like serious jubilation. So don't allow the thing to slide and say, oh, 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 they can't remove you. Somebody will say this is house. And the person will have paper covering your house. <laughs> All right. Um, I think your father may not be alive, you see. My senior is on the line echo. Yes, 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 yes. Um Pretty, yeah. very you can have a turn. I can see your hand is up. Mm, senior, please. Oh. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Senior. Yeah. Um, I believe you're all well. Thanks a lot for the presentation I have been following. I just want to say something about the mental state. I think someone asked a question of um, how do we, more or less like, how do we know someone is mentally unsound to write a will? And you gave an answer. I just want to support um, what you said earlier on. Um, when you check section 2.2, two, I think, um, it would talk about capacity. And it will say that to the extent that he can understand the implications of the will he's executing, mm -hmm. then he can make a will. But yes. if a person is in a state where he cannot understand and we are looking at somebody whose mind is not sound. If he cannot understand, then he can't um, execute a will. So what we then gather is that a person may actually be unsound. But if we can see that he understands the implications of the dispositions he's making and the nature of the document he's signing, then we are good to go. And he may also be doing this at a lucid interval at a period when we say that, quote and unquote, he has come home. If the mind has come home, he may during that time execute. So it is not uh, completely hopeless for people with mental issues. At a certain point, when they can understand that the nature of the document they are signing is a testament and it is disposing property, if we can appreciate that one or they can appreciate that one, then they can sign. And I like how you supported it with um, a video coverage so that if we can have that one supporting his execution, then we are good to go. Um, someone also asks whether we can video record somebody's testamentary um, dispositions. And you, you rightly answered. When it comes to wills, the ordinance type we inherited from the English people, then it is strictly writing. And if somebody says, I don't want to write, I want to speak, 
then we are going under customary wills where the person would have to gather some reliable witnesses around him or her and then make some declarations. Same will be recorded in front of the witnesses and that will suffice for a customary will. But it won't come, we can't have it under the ordinance one, which is strictly speaking a written document. So that's all I want to say to what you said in law. Thank you, Senia. Right. Thank you very much. Senia Redu, thank you. Thank you very Welcome, much, Casey, for that. Welcome. All right. So someone wants to know, can wills made about 30 years ago be retrieved at the high court? That's a key. Yes. Yes, it, well. it can be retrieved. All you need to do is to write a letter and say this is the name of the deceased. Uh, he died at this time. He lived here. He worked here. Check whether or not he has a will. If he has, it will come up. All right. They don't lose documents. Oh, there are, there, there's a good registry now that has uh, updated itself. But then, if you go and search for the will and you don't have it there, and the estate is still outstanding, like my 34 year old <laughs> estate that I went to conclude last week, you can still do an LA so mm. that uh, you would. Uh, deal with the estate appropriately because you see when the people who are administering the estates do not have the authority to do so they are intermeddling secondly you cannot pass on property from one generation to the other if you don't go through the legal processes of administration of estates it is only when the house you are living in comes into dispute or somebody who is your tenant comes to say they will not pay rent and you go to court and lose then you understand what we are doing because I, I sat in court one day and somebody didn't have a vesting asset. And for three years, they were going to court and coming in a good school. And they just said, because you don't have a vesting asset, I cannot uh, give you uh, judgment. But the house belonged to them under a certain estate, uh, under a certain will. They didn't go to prove probate. They didn't prove probate. They didn't uh, do vesting. They were just there. Oh, our father has given the thing to us. They were just sitting down quietly. They went to court and lost. The house belongs to them but they didn't have vesting. So what we are discussing is not about, I will do, I will not do. Once the, the thing will pass on to you or has passed on to you, you must take steps whether you have a will or you don't have a will. If you have a will, praise God. If you don't have a will, go under LA and let the help come to you so that you can enjoy the benefits properly. Yeah. Otherwise, one day when there's a fight, you will lose even though the thing belongs to your father or your mother. All right. Um, Leticia wants to know, can an ex-wife who has become a concubine after the divorce also benefit from the estates? <laughs> this is a dicey one. <laughs> when divorces are done, uh, generally, well, this one, I, I'm not speaking from any experience. With, I'm speaking from my just general knowledge. <laughs> Maybe. When divorces are done, things are shared, okay? Now, yeah. if in the course of the concubinage, they were still putting out themselves as husband and wife, okay, then maybe, 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 but it will be very difficult. Uh, Especially when the family members know that you are an ex wife, I, I think it will be difficult, but I don't know. Somebody is uh, asking whether I will can be contested after 15 years. Okay. The Limitation uh, Act. Those of us who are lawyers, would the limitation have to catch this person? <laughs> I'm not, I haven't averted my mind to whether we can contest the will after 15 years. I mean, we can search for the answer and let you know, but right now it doesn't come directly to me. Adisu. Yes, yes, it's not coming directly to me. Is there someone who wants to help? Um, uh, yeah. Mr. Redis on the line, Mr. Barry. Do you want to say something again, or is there a former hand? I think it's a former hand. Okay. All right. And um, while the lawyer search for that, um, the, um, Mark wants to ask, what's the difference between a trust and a will? What's the difference between the trust and the will? And Pastor T, good evening. We, we hear you. Yes. And is there, what's the difference between a trust and a will? Okay. Generally, some uh, complicated wills have trust in them. 
So uh, to answer in a layman's uh, language, a trust is uh, basically putting, let's say, certain assets in place for your children's benefits under the guidance of particular persons or under the, it's a, you institute a certain project. For example, my company, if I am not there, I put it in the hands of maybe Auntie Sue and maybe my husband for the benefit of my children. That one is how the trusts are done. Mm -hmm. I mean, put it in the layman's way. <laughs> so I trust just just um, because now on social media you see a lot you know don't buy anything in your name buy it in a trust and it if you die it goes to a trust you know that uh, those uh, things um do trust have to be or trust are registered with the register of companies it doesn't come to the court how 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 does that work in relation to wills for example if maybe the person who has a trust passes on. How, how does that um, succession happen? Hey, I haven't thought about it all. But uh, generally, oh yes, that's the truth. Generally, uh, the, 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 the recent one that I did was for a lady who put certain things in trust for her only son, okay? And named people who are not even in the same jurisdiction. One of them is in the US, one of them is in Nigeria, one of them is in Ghana, to be in charge of those assets for the benefits of her son. Make sure that, the, for example, so she puts some houses, she puts some uh, shares in companies, she puts some bank accounts in trust because the child is, is this time that we're doing the thing for the child, child is still, I think about five or six years old at, at this time that we are doing that. Okay, so it's basically you are putting it together in the name of those people for them to keep for that child when the child grows older to take over. So the child will be taken over when he's 21. As to uh, when people die before they can, can, even if they are executors, okay, some executors die before the testators die. What we do in those cases is that we replace them. We go to the court and show the court that this person is supposed to be in charge of A, B, C, D, and they have died. So we want the court to substitute their name for this person. Or there are times when you name some people as your executors and trustees. But at the time of the execution, they say, I am not interested. You will go to court and replace them. So that's uh, the practical thing that I have seen. The others that I've not seen, I have to come and tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all you. right, all right. I see a hand up. Um, Doris. Yes, Doris. Yes, Doris. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Doris, you're, you're on. Doris, you want to ask a question or? Okay, Doris, we're not able to hear you. Okay, so whilst we wait for her, we will just go on with the question we have here from Stephen. Stephen says, how? Okay, Doris is trying to. Okay, Doris, yes, you can, you can ask your question. Good evening. Good evening, Good Doris. Evening. Thank, you. Thank you for the program. You're welcome. Uh, I'm in a house with my husband um, where part of the land has been built. But uh, the whole land belongs to him and then a brother. And so um, it has come to it that uh, there should be a division. And so we try to do the site plan and stuff. But uh, when we were going to do the site plan, I asked my husband whose name should be on it. And he said his name. Actually, I was expecting that the two of us name would be on it. But all that he said was his name should be on it. In this case, if something happens, um, can any of my children or can I claim ownership 
or the brother can say that so far as it's his brother's name that is on it, then he is uh, he has the right to take it. All right. Thank you very much for that question, Auntie Doris. Yes, Kezia, over to you. Okay, so maybe what we should do is to do partitioning. But find a lawyer and do partitioning of the property because it's for you and your husband and the younger brother, okay? So if they do partitioning of the property, even if it is one plot and they share it into halves so that uh, the partition will say that uh, from this point to that point is Mr. A's, from that point to this point is Mr. B's, then it will protect your house that you have put up, put up on that half, okay? The second thing that you 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 have you don't have to be worried about is that uh, everybody knows that you are in the marriage with your husband. Everybody knows that you have been cooking and helping, so you are a beneficiary to automatic. Okay, uh, whatever happens, once the partitionings are done, and the brother cannot come and say what belongs to uh, your husband, brother belongs to him. No, you'll be fine. Okay. So work at doing the partitioning so that your, the portions are clearly demarcated because your brother and your husband, your brother-in-law and your husband may not even have issues. It is the, the, the children of those people who may have issues when the two men are not around. That is what you should be worried about. That's why the partitioning is critical, okay? All right. Okay. Moses did so. All right, you want to read that? Oh, yes, yeah, so Moses. Um, Kilisel wants to know. So, you're, you're, you're welcome. You're, we're happy to have you here. Another colleague lawyer. <laughs> Same, well, I think you've answered, you've already um, addressed this issue about the will that is not deposited. So, I, I think we'll skip that. Yeah. And then, uh, did you answer the question about the fraudulent um, um, submission? um of a will by fraudster no i think we didn't read that so how will the court determine a misleading will deposited by the high court by fraudster and that's from steven oh i, I really <laughs> i really don't know but when wills are read okay before we go into probate people come have the opportunity to come and caveat it or raise issues about it so at the point where the probate, the will is read, a probate will be uh, taken. Those are the times that you can come and say, no, 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 no. My father cried, he was blind. Or oh, by the time he, that this will was supposed to be done, no, 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 no. He was not mentally sound to do a will, okay? So I think that those are the times that you can come to court and challenge your, your, your the, the will. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have um, a few, but um, there's a, something in the chat about uh, Muslim secession from Umar Moro Kamate. Um, I think giving quite a bit of detail, so um, we can check it out. Um, okay, Trudy says she understands. Um, I think uh, this would be from Pastor T. He says, um, who used an iPad the last time, but just assuming. And a child, Pazati, good evening again. Can a child who has not been legally adopted or fostered be counted as a benefiting child of the deceased estate? There is no will. Bishop opinion ruled that the children has been raised by the deceased and has for all their lives now. And for all their lives has been known as a deceased person's child traditionally. So Kezia, yeah, the question is, if the deceased died, having been in the practice of taking care of someone, but this person was not formally or legally adopted, would the person be counted as part of the children of the deceased? These cases are not clear cut. Um, they are the, these particular issues are the gray areas of, of, of this kind of practice. So sometimes the court will look at the circumstances of these children, okay? Are they still in need of care of this deceased person who was in charge of them? 
uh, how was the diseased person treating them? If we just say they are not biological in terms of uh, parentage, so they should just get out, what will be the effect of same? So I think that the courts will look at these cases on a case by case basis. But if the person is an adult, what they do is in the UK doing very well and was considered a child of the diseased. And so now wants to compose really benefit. Sometimes the courts may take them out, even though they, the, court, the, the person saw you as a child, raised you and all that, you see. But if your circumstances, it depends on the case by case basis in this situation. There, there's one that is pending in a certain court now. <laughs> the case has not been determined, but the man considered this particular person his child, collected his, her marital uh, dowry and all those things. And then the family members say, hey, he, she's not a biological child. You want to smoke people into the thing. So uh, what the, 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 the child's mother was saying is that no, the man recognized the child as his child. She was even the one who was taking the man all over the place to hospitals. Uh, came from abroad, came to stay with the, the diseased and all the rest of it. The diseased collected dowry on behalf of that child and all that. But she, the child does not need the estate of the diseased, okay? Just that we, as we are listing his children, we just listed her. If you want her not to benefit, she may not need it. So I'm, what I'm saying is that it is on a case by case basis. The court will look at the circumstances of those children, whether they still need a care, of this uh, diseased person's estate and all that, and make a determination that is fair to everyone in the, in the matter, okay? Okay. Okay, let's have a look at some of the questions we have on our link. Um, just a minute. There's a question here from someone saying, what is the distinction between a legal heir and a compulsory one? And then question two, a person who is illiterate, blind, deaf, and dumb, how will such a person make a will for mobility? The distinction between a legal heir and, an, and, a, and a compulsory heir, I don't know if you can help with that. And then a person who is illiterate, blind, deaf, and dumb, how will the person make a will? The legal hair, the compulsory hair. I don't know what the compulsory would entail. Yeah. But the legal hair is like biological children or people that you have adopted and they are directly your dependents or your spouses. Okay. They inherit you directly. Maybe that is what um, that may mean. As for compulsory, I am not too sure. Uh, but the person who is illiterate, blind, deaf, and dumb, all of this person in one person. Oh, <laughs> this is a tall order. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's a very tall order. And an illiterate can make a will once we read the content to him. And like my brother has said, my brother Echo, still on the call, he said that once a person appreciates that they are making a will and they are disposing of property to their family, it's beautiful, it's okay. If a person is blind and we can read it to them and they appreciate what they are doing, they can also make a will. A deaf and dumb person may be able to read. So if he can read and he appreciates that this is a will, he's also good to go, okay? Uh, but all of the above plus deaf and dumb, that one is, and then blind also. That one, I, I, I beg, I don't know what to say. But I don't think somebody will have all of this together. No, it's too much. Okay. okay. Somebody, says, okay. somebody says we should take them through a process of depositing their will. Okay. When they finish selling it, they will stamp it and sign it off. And go and deposit it in the court. That's how simple it is. You just bring your ID, bring your... um photograph, then the lawyer will sign on the envelope that he prepared it. And then there's a red uh, something, we, I don't know the name of it, but we melt it and use it to seal the will so that it looks like nobody has tempered with it. And then we go to court and deposit it. That's what we do. Yeah. I, I think my answer would be that the person should just go to a lawyer 
and then the lawyer will just uh, because definitely you need to see a lawyer in in this. Okay, I, I think um, um on the basis of the challenges, we are very sorry we are not able to take um questions um if if you have any, but um we believe this will not be the end of the conversation. Um, so the I'm sure we would uh we would we would work out something, but just to announce. Our next um our next webinar would be would be on Father's um day. So we want to say okay, okay, okay. So thank you all for being here. We are so sorry that we cannot um take any more questions. Um Casey, I was so happy that you agreed to do this. We would share her her website link if there's any in the description section of this video. We'll be loading this video onto our YouTube channel. Flood Light Daily, which is F L O O D for Flood and Light L I G H T, like normal flood lights, daily D A I L Y. So we have a YouTube channel on, on YouTube called Flood Lights Daily. So in about a week or so, we or a couple of days, we would um upload this video there. And yes, like Emmanuel was saying, we would have a, a, a show, God willing, on, on Father's Day. That's going to be the 7th, the 18th of June, the third Sunday in June. That's the 18th of June. We are looking forward to speaking with Kia Stevens. Kia Stevens is a Black American author of a book that recently came out, Overcoming Father Wounds. And we are, we are looking at having a, a discussion with her on, on her book and on her journey, on, on why she wrote the book and what the book is all about. So we will make the link available and we'll make information available as time goes on. Thank you all for being here. We'll take a short a short prayer and then we we'll wrap it up. Yes, and Thank in you. the in the in the last quarter as well, we'll be looking at technology, handling technology in the family as well. How do we handle in the in our light of research and all the things? How do we handle technology uh, from a family perspective? So let's also look forward to that in the in the subsequent quarters as we come. All right, um, Antikezia, thank you so much. God so much yeah. bless you. Maybe would ask you to um, just say a prayer to close us um, because we're having challenges here also. Um, yes, please just, if you can just say a prayer for us. Thank you very much. Father, thank you. We thank you for Emmanuel and Susan. Thank you for flood lights. Thank you for everyone that has gathered in the call and even those who have dropped off. We bless you for the ability to educate us on the issues of succession and the fact that it is your will that we leave an inheritance to our children and their children. We pray that you enable us to do that and to do it appropriately. Thank you for this new week that you will bless us and increase us on every side. Jesus mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Ah, thank you so Amen. much. Amen.